All right, now we're joined by Tim Burgess, who's running for City Council Position 8. So go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Thank you very much for uh, having me back. And thank you for your endorsement in my 2011 council race when I ran for the election. I hope you repeat that again this time. So uh, I think I've told all of you before, I have a wonderful job. And it's a job that I love because I get to do things that matter for the people of Seattle. This last year has been a whirlwind of activity at the City Council. We passed a safe, safe, uh, uh, sick and safe leave law, which I was the key negotiator uh, in for that final passage of that, which gave employees the right to care for themselves and their family. We passed a minimum wage law that took care of sustainable long-term funding for our parks and open space. Last November, we passed an amazing transit enhancement package that in June and September of this year will lead to the largest increases in transit service that we've ever seen in Seattle. And the one that I'm most proud of last November, almost 70% of Seattle voters said yes to the Seattle Preschool Program, which is a huge progressive win for our kids, for our families, and for the city as a whole. I, that's the kind of work I want to keep doing for the people of Seattle. And I think I've established a reputation on the council as being a, a thoughtful, pragmatic, progressive leader that, that gets things done. And that's what I'd like to continue to do for the next two years uh, in this term, which is a short term until this position syncs up with the mayor and city attorney and then becomes a, a four-year term. So I'd be happy to answer your questions. Great, so now we have four prepared questions, and they're actually right in front of you. Feel free to turn it over and read along as we say I'm allowed. Uh, these are two-minute answers, and uh, Joseph, we'll start with number one. Sure. Seattle is experiencing a housing affordability crisis. Several policy responses have been suggested, including linkage fees, incentive zoning, subsidized housing, rent control, and others. What is your approach to keeping Seattle affordable? So we do face an affordable housing crisis in our city, and last fall the City Council passed a resolution related to uh, affordable housing and expressing our uh, expectation that uh, in late May the Council will begin uh, deliberation on a whole series of recommendations, including uh, the linkage fee that you mentioned here. Uh, in the next couple of weeks I'll be introducing some legislation that will uh, expand the notification period required when landowners, uh, landlords are going to uh, ask a tenant to move out. Uh, we're going to introduce legislation that will require uh, building owners who own multifamily housing that serves low income people to give the city first notice if they're going to sell that property so that the city could exercise an option to purchase to preserve that affordable housing or assist a nonprofit organization to do the same. But most importantly, uh, we're working now on a policy statement that says that affordable housing is a right of the citizens of Seattle. We have nothing like that in the city comprehensive plan or in our municipal code today. Um, so we're going to be introducing that. And I, I believe that we should shift to man, what's called mandatory incentive zoning. Bellingham does it, Kirkland does it, Redmond does it, Federal Way does it, Seattle doesn't do it. And that is where if you're going to build and take advantage of incentives, you have to set aside so many units for affordable housing. But even if you don't take advantage of the incentive, you would have to still set aside the, the uh, units for affordable housing. Uh, great, item number two. Excuse me. Why does that right? Last year, voters approved a levy to fund a universal preschool pilot program. After the pilot concludes, how would you fund the full implementation of the program, and what policy changes would you make to assure this plan addresses educational disparities in our city? So let me take them in reverse order. The preschool program is a four-year pilot. And it is, especially in the early years, designed specifically for uh, children of color and children in areas of the city where the uh, elementary school performance is lower than we would like to see. So it is definitely aimed at kids who need it the most. But the program is also developed so that all 
families can participate because we know that in classrooms of mixed economic kids coming from various economic backgrounds, all kids benefit, but the poor kids benefit the most. So we deliberately designed it that way. Um, funding is going to be an issue in four years because this is a four year levy. Uh, ideally, in a perfect world, the federal government will by that time have approved President Obama's uh, universal preschool for all program. Uh, we're not holding our breath, but that would be great and that would cure this funding problem. Or the state of Washington will have stepped up and fully funded universal preschool. I personally think that in a couple of years or 10 years, I know, and we will redefine the K-12 education system to be one year of preschool through 12. Um, but we are going to have to struggle with this funding uh, in, in three or four years. The city has the capacity to do more in terms of funding. We started very slow to focus on quality instead of quantity. Uh, we have various options to um, ask the voters to raise property taxes. Voters can also raise the business and occupation tax. We did it once in the 1980s to fund the hiring of additional police officers. We could do it to fund the preschool. So we have a lot of options to exercise and uh, we'll be looking carefully at that in a couple of years. David, right. number three. Uh, Bertha, so Scott, what options does the city of Seattle have with respect to potential cost overruns, the waterfront, transit, and, and unsafe viaduct? So um, the city doesn't have many options with regard to cost overruns because we're not responsible for it. It's a state project. Uh, it's very clear that the state is in charge of constructing the tunnel and taking down the viaduct that's there today. And we don't believe that the city has legal liability for that state project. They have done a what's called a design-build contract, so that the contractor who's actually uh, doing the work is responsible for uh, that work. And we don't believe that the city has legal obligations for cost overruns. We're keenly aware of the fact that Bertha is not moving forward like it's supposed to be doing. Um, hopefully. We'll see that change by July or August of this year. Where we are focused is to make sure that the viaduct remains safe <clears throat> and remains open. But if it's not safe, it needs to be closed. And that the other projects related to the waterfront and the State 99 uh, project are completed successfully, like shutting down the Battery Street Tunnel, taking down the viaduct, rebuilding Alaskan Way along the waterfront, building the public space and park that's going to be down there in the pedestrian promenade. So it's important that the project be completed, um, both for our waterfront purposes, but certainly for our regional transportation system as well. Great. Maria, number four. Seattle is the fastest growing big city in the country. Should we encourage or discourage this growth, and what policy changes are necessary to accommodate this growth? Even if we try to discourage this growth, I'm not sure we could get away with that. I think uh, people are coming to Seattle because this is a great place to live and our region is a thriving region. Uh, before I went on the council, uh, back in the uh, late 90s, the city made the decision about urban villages and urban centers, and that's where we're going to concentrate our density. I think that is generally working well. Where we've had some problems, and Ballard here is an example, is where uh, we saw this huge increase in residential uh, units, but we did not keep pace with the infrastructure originally. So for example, transit service uh, still is not the best, although the rapid line has certainly helped a lot, but we don't always get our infrastructure planning in sync with the density as the city grows. I've been a big proponent of uh, the density program that we have. Uh, I don't think we should be afraid of people coming to our city, and um, especially the creation of new jobs in our city, and that's one of the main reasons people are coming, is because we're creating a lot of jobs. Now, the challenge we have, in addition to the infrastructure keeping pace, is that this growth is not benefiting everybody. So, there are pockets of our city geographically, and there are people in our city 
who are not being able to take advantage of the economic growth that we're seeing. And I think things like preschool, things like the Nurse Family Partnership, things like what we're going to do with affordable housing this summer are all very important steps to make sure that everybody's benefiting um, in the city as a whole. So now we'll open it up to follow-up questions. These are one-minute answers. John, Renee, and we'll move on from there. Okay. Um, Juan, or your only opponent, has suggested that you're not near progressive enough for the city of Seattle. How would you respond to that? be the judge for that. I mean, my record is what it is. If you look at my literature and see what I've done, if you look at the progressive leaders in the Democratic Party uh, who've endorsed me, um, labeling is fine. I, I tend, tend not to engage in those things. And, uh, I'm comfortable with my political skin. Uh, I think the things that I've been a champion for clearly show up on the progressive side of the ledger. So, I, I don't know. Renee and Elizabeth. Um, so I was going to ask about the, you know, you're saying a lot of people don't benefit, and in particular in the Northwest sector, I think there's been a um, demand for social services that doesn't really exist. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the social structure, social service delivery structure that might be um, an idea, and I'm also continue to ask about development of work between 85th and 146. Ideas for that development in that corridor. Yes. Um, so the city doesn't, we don't directly decide where social services will be cited, although we can certainly encourage where they go. I, I drove out on 15th West on my 68 mile a gallon scooter to come out here tonight and drove by the Downtown Emergency Services Center, um, a new facility for um, alcohol and drug rehabilitation. There's like 85 apartment units in this building. It's probably looked like it was about half done. That's not the north end, but it's getting outside the downtown core. It's certainly closer. Um, the city right now is going through a very thorough evaluation of how we deliver human services. Um, we spend just in the area of homelessness last year. We spent just over 40 million dollars. That's more than any city in the United States except New York and Los Angeles. Um, but the assessment of how we spend that money uh, shows that we have a lot of improvement to do to make sure that we're targeting to the right people, that we're getting a good return on investment. In other words, people are actually being helped um, so that we can help more. Time. Oops. <laughs> That's all right. All right, uh, Elizabeth, then we'll Okay, so I understand the need for um, density given the fact that other people are moving here. However, what I feel and many others do is that we're completely destroying the individual character of our neighborhoods. Um, all the buildings that are up are most of them are huge, they're ugly, they take up an entire block, there's no break between them, and they're completely destroying the character that used to you know, so precious to us. And now all the neighborhoods are looking the same. So what would you do to remedy that? I hear that a lot, and in my own, I live on Upper Queen Anne, and we now have a canyon of buildings and apartments down the, our main uh, drive on the top of the hill. Um, so, a couple of answers. First of all, there, the density tends to be almost exclusively in our urban villages and urban centers, where we said we're going to put it, so at least that part's working. The smaller residential single-family areas have generally not been uh, touched by this. Although a lot of people have their homes, <coughs> their single-family homes, in areas that they don't realize are multifamily zoned, and so suddenly an apartment building goes up next to them and they wonder, gosh, what's happening here? Um, I think the design uh, guidelines that we have in that process, which is also being reviewed now for change, can help with that. But you're right, you have a clash of big change that's coming in relatively small areas, and that creates a lot of friction. Um, but generally, after I think people get used to it, they, they, they come to live with it, if not appreciate it. I didn't like what was happening in my neighborhood. I now like it. We have many more restaurant choices as a result of these buildings being built. All right, uh, so Maria, then Janet. And Janet. 
Yeah, you mentioned um, that the about the or, uh, that the city is not on the hook because a lot of us have a different understanding. The city would be on the hook for overruns. You um, think that the contractor has the burden for cost overruns. Um, so could you just expand a little bit on that? Like, has there been any sort of legal rules about that or contracts that? Like, let us know a little bit more because I think we could really listen to that. So, the, the state attorney general has issued a written opinion that the okay. city of Seattle is not on the hook. Our city attorney has done the same. The contract, the city of Seattle is not a partner to the contract right. between Washington and the construction company. So, I, I think where people get confused is mm -hmm. way back in 2007 or 8, okay. the legislature put a little phrase in the enabling legislation for the tunnel that says, Seattle area property owners will pay for cost overruns. Mm -hmm. uh, the governor at the time, the attorney general, um, have all said that that's not enforceable and that the city of Seattle is not responsible for that state project. And we've talked to legislators about this. And this would be like the state of Washington saying to a legislator in Spokane when they do that little uh, extra add-on to the freeway over there, by the way, the city of Spokane is to pay for any overruns. Legislators in Eastern Washington will go nuts. Okay, but if I think we need our control, the city has over Well, we have control in that it's happening inside the city of Seattle, mm -hmm. and we have public safety requirements related to the viaduct, but we're not a party to the tunnel contract. No, uh, Janet and then Mary. Mm -hmm. Just a second, let's get it. Everything we said. <laughs> For your question, we can take more. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the Universal Pilot Preschool Pilot mm -hmm. Program. Um, currently, we are seeing um, a wonderful group of providers stepping up across the city, and this is a little bit to echo Renee's concerns about Northwest Seattle. And let me define Northwest Seattle as between 85th and 145th. When you look at the map, that sector is really, you know, both um, gasping for good social services, as Renee said, but also for good quality preschool. We have a little bit of a head start there, but. So um, there's not providers in the North End that are stepping up. And the, pop, the legislation may need to be modified in order to encourage that. And I wonder if you would speak to the willingness of the council and the planners to modify that legislation in order to get preschools in the North yeah. Sector. So the city is going through the process of selecting providers now. And I don't know who the providers are going to be or who's stepping up to do that or not do that. So I can't comment on that specifically. I just don't have that information. This is a four-year pilot. And so we know that there will be adjustments along the way as we learn things. Um, but we're also starting very small. Next September, when the first classroom is open, there are only going to be 14 of them. And that grows to 100 by year four. So we're definitely starting small. I mean, I wish we could have waved a magic wand and have all 12,000 three and four year olds in preschool in September of this next year, but that's just physically impossible. And we learned from Boston, because they started really fast, made a lot of mistakes and had to retool in year three. And they're now regarded as the gold standard at scale preschool classrooms in the United States and we're kind of following their lead. All right, um, Mary and Michael, if we have time and if we really have time, then let's. Um, the preschool program, I'm curious about several things. Uh, relationship to the Seattle public schools. Um, one of the other candidates for city council, not the same position, commented that the curriculum might be not hands on to people. Um, and then locations. Because don't you think <coughs> preschools have to have a couple of classrooms on the site in order to participate? Is that correct? They, they, have, to they have to offer at least two classrooms. They two don't necessarily classrooms. have to be in the same place. Oh, okay. But they have to offer same at least two. Okay. Yeah, same so provider. just comment mm -hmm. on any of that. So, um, what was the first part of your question? I'm sure. um, connected to the school district. Oh, it's connected to the school district, yes. Yeah. So the school district was one of our strategic partners in planning the preschool program. Mm -hmm. And they have indicated that they will have some classrooms in the program, but very few in the first mm -hmm. couple of years. They have a huge space challenge. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Yes, exactly. So 
I, I suspect that in September, maybe two or as many as four of the classrooms might be provided by the public schools. Others will be community-based providers. The curricula are two um, evidence-based uh, curricula that have been proven to actually move the needle on student uh, preparedness for kindergarten. So again, in the first couple of years, there's only two curricula that can be used. Seattle Public Schools already uses one of them, and many of the other providers in the city use one or, or the other of those uh, curricula already. We do allow for a change in curriculum beginning, I believe, in year three. Okay, so we um, are past 20 minutes, so uh, unfortunately we don't have time for more questions, but if you'd like to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Um, thank you for your time. I always appreciate coming here. Take a look at what I've cited as my accomplishments. Look at the individuals who've endorsed the campaign. Um, I think we can be successful and continue to do the good work that, that we've started over the last few years. So thank you. Thank you.